Psalm 122 verse 1. It says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Thank you for staying standing. Sometimes in my meetings, we stand for the entire service. I tell everybody I'm helping them because you burn more calories when you're standing. You know, um, in, in terms of weight loss, I don't, I don't mean to brag, but I uh, completed my 30-day diet in just four hours and 30 minutes. Amen. <laughs> yeah, and so this morning you are listening to a, a really sane person. I want to assure you of that. I've seen my psychologist recently. I said, is it weird that I hear voices? And my psychiatrist said, you don't have a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, it is a problem, isn't it? <laughs> You know, uh, this, this passage here, I love, I love the Psalms, but this passage here leads us into a New Testament story that I'm going to get to shortly. But uh, I want to talk about getting unstuck. I want to talk about, and we, we heard a message a, a little about this uh, during the conference about getting out of paralysis. And that's, that's really important because all of us would prefer safety and security and to deal with the familiar than to walk into the unknown. Personally, I'm, I'm, I'm in that 3% of the population who really hate just staying in the known. I always want to step into something unknown and go to a new place and experience something new. But apparently at least 60% of the, the population are in that category of don't change anything. We like it just how it is. And so it's, it's kind of annoying because God puts people like me in charge of congregations and we keep wanting to make changes and they keep wanting to stay the same and just safety, security. And safety is a big issue today. Uh, and a lot of people, that's their aspiration, to have a safe life. And uh, my, my problem is I, I actually don't want a safe life. I like edginess. And, and so, uh, uh, but, but it's those, those edgy people who get us into places where we didn't want to go, but we kiss them when we get there. And, and I have found being a leader of a church, and now of nearly 600 churches, and that means 600 pastors pray for me, uh, that, that to, to take people somewhere, it, it's inevitable. You just get pushback. You get re resistance. You get all kinds of things. So the, uh, understanding the art of leading people into change is, is essential. And especially as people get older, they tend to, they tend to calcify. They tend to atrophy and, and, and get even more stuck. And so I want to talk to you today about how to keep moving because God is a moving God and you do not want to stay stuck when the cloud moves. But I've watched a lot of churches stay stuck when the cloud kept moving. I've, I've watched a, a lot of ministries who once were really on the cutting edge, but then the edge became blunt and, and they didn't keep moving. And I've watched Christians who went good for a while, but then they didn't deepen their relationship with Jesus enough. They were relying on the novelty of church and new songs and everything else. But that'll wear off after a while. Unless you develop a depth of relationship and devotion to Christ, uh, it, you, you're not going to be satisfied with just the external uh, outer court experience. You need to go in deeper and discover Jesus so that He's enough. And, and, and I, I mean that at a very deep level because a lot of people uh, simply uh, are not seeking His face, they're seeking His hand. And the Bible says, if you seek my face, you'll find me. And, uh, and, and if you want only God to do things for you with his hand, you're going to miss the joy of staring into his face. And, and when, you, when you come to that, that point where you've gone beyond the cross, where God saved me, saved me, saved me, set me free, and you've moved beyond that to where he is now Lord, you've got to move from having him as Savior to having him as Lord. And when he's Lord, it doesn't matter if he answers your prayers or not, because he's enough. And, 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 and God does have different ways of answering prayers. When you're young, uh, in, in Christ, it's great because he answers them pretty well straight away. Woohoo! God's alive. It's amazing. And then there's another, there's another way that God answers prayer, and that's where he takes some time. He take, takes a while. And he teaches you a deeper thing called patience which is waiting for a thing with a good attitude. And so, and so you develop character, length of spirit, 
Another word for patience is capacity. So if you ever want to have something big, get ready for a long trial. Because your length of spirit is your capacity. How long can you put up with an annoying thing? Is it like three seconds? Ding, ding, boom, and you blow up. People explode or implode. And uh, so what's going to happen to you after you've got this long, long trial? And as long as you hang in there, you develop a thing called capacity. Some of you have got a, a, a huge destiny, like an 18-wheel truck destiny. But you've got a Toyota Corolla motor. So your capacity to carry that destiny is not actually there. And so God works on us before the destiny turns up, increasing our capacity to cope. Capacity is the ability to cope. So I get a problem today in the last two days. I've had two major problems coming through the phone, uh, serious ones that I have to now go and confront somebody uh, in, a, in a few days and you know, have the difficult, awkward conversations, which we all try to avoid. But you've you got to master the art of, a, of awkward conversations, even if you want your marriage to keep going. Even if you want, if you want to lead people, you've got to be able to sit down and actually get through that, that area. So to develop that capacity for that to constantly happening without it killing you, without it giving you a breakdown, God is going to take you through secret trials. He's going to take you through times in your secret life that you can't tell anybody about. And you, you, you're facing these traumas and difficulties and challenges. But you need to know you're going to come through that. And you're going to end up on the other side of that a lot bigger and better person than you were before you went into it. And there is, there is no way you can avoid it if you want to do what God has called you to do. Abraham had a vision. But a guy called Abraham fulfilled it. A guy called Jacob got a vision. But another man called Israel fulfilled it. But it was the same man. He just had a different name. He'd been through a night of wrestling. Not wrestling with the devil, wrestling with God. God was saying, I want to wrestle with you. He's, he's your father. He's not your mother. Which is disappointing for some people because they want a nurturing, caring, loving God who just pats them down and, 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 and lets them live an entitled life. But it isn't, he's not like that. He's the one who pushes the swing higher. You're okay, kid. Get up off the ground. You're not dead. We want him to come and kiss us and cuddle us and all those lovely things. But he's not your mother. He's your father. And he'll train you and help you to become a rugged, strong person of capacity. And so, so you find guys like Peter. Simon got a vision, but a guy called Peter fulfilled it. And, and God gives you a destiny, but between you and the fulfillment, or even the beginning of the fulfillment of that thing, are some, some, some issues and, and, and dark times that you will travel through, but they're going to become the most precious moments in your entire life, because you'll find there are treasures of darkness. And you'll find that, that all you've got to do, all you've got to do is keep walking. Now, I know, I know about... Sammy's experience of the, the walking and the doors open, and, and I've experienced that myself. But there's a, there's a walkway in that uh, terminal, in the Chicago terminal too, when you get on that moving walkway. You know some people, they get on that thing and they just sort of stand there? Right? And they got three bags, and you can't get past, because I just, I want to walk on the thing, because it speeds up your walking. Okay, so on this particular one, it's got keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. And the voice keeps everybody walking. That's all you've got to do when you're in a trial. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why are there a pile of bones in the valley in Ezekiel? They stop walking. They're in the valley but when they got depressed, they said, oh, I'm going to give up on the marriage. Oh, I'm going to give up on church. I'm not going to keep walking in this way. I'm just going to sit down. I'm not going to have another go at selling. I've been rejected a hundred times. I've tried, I've tried to get that person to come to church ten times now. And they keep walking. 
keep walking. Keep walking. You're going to find the miracle is in keeping on walking. If you get stuck, you die. Getting unstuck means I've got to take my first step. And today, I don't know what that first step is. It might be to go out and put a deposit on the house. It may be to ask her to marry you. It may be for you, if you're unmarried, and you know, I mean, for a New Zealand girl to be unmarried, that's sort of like unthinkable, right? So some, somehow, there's got to be a step you can take. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in this message. So Psalm 122, he said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So this, the message is, is let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the house. Everything is better done in teams. They said to me, let us go. They didn't give me an invitation to a meeting and then say, go down to that. They went with me. Walk with people. That helps them get unstuck. But even more importantly, it helps you get unstuck. You'll find that when you start walking, when you say, let's go, let us go together. And the whole New Testament is a together experience. Love one another. Move together. All over this nation, as you're down there in, in Invercargill, and you're there in Queenstown, all over the nation, it gets a little more interesting to do it as congregations around a nation when you're this far apart. But how about this? We're talking to each other right now. And we together can see global impact, have a global impact, because we're walking together. We say, let us go to the house of the Lord together. The purpose was to take somebody to church. I was glad. And you'd be surprised how many people are glad when finally somebody says to them, let's go to church. How many prodigals do you know out there who used to come, don't come now? Just a little phone call. Put down a name today that you'll call this week. Say, hey, let's go to church. Pray about the day. Maybe Friday's the best day. Maybe Wednesday. I don't know. But there's got to be a day when I reach out from my stuck position and say, I'm going to get somebody else who's, un who's stuck and we'll go to church. We'll move together. We'll, 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 we'll take action. So when you come down into Luke 5, verse 16 to 26, it says, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee or Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then, behold, man brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed, threw the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Whew. What a story. Okay, so this guy, he's paralyzed. He's stuck. He's on a bed, but he's got four friends. Best kind of friends you can have. Always better to work together as a team. You know geese, they fly in that formation. They, they only burn half the body fat that they would normally burn if they're flying on their own to get that far because they're flying in the slipstream of somebody else. If, if one of them gets injured, two of them go down and sit with them uh, on, on the ground until until that one's recovered so they can protect them from predators. And then they join the next bee crowd that's coming through, fly up and take off with them. You know uh, how one line is always longer than the other line? You know why that is? Because there's more geese in that one. I know we're deep. We're deep here today. I'm sorry about that. You know, uh, Belgian horses, have you ever heard of Belgian horses? These things are huge, and they, they can pull, they have contests where they pull weight. One can pull 8,000 pounds, the champion, 8,000 pounds of dead weight, big lead block that they have behind them, or steel block. Two, you'd think, could carry, could pull 16,000 pounds. 
But no, they don't. They pull 24,000 pounds. So our power increases when we do things together. Two that knew each other, that's two strangers. You put two stranger Belgian horses together, they can, they can pull 24,000. But if you get two that know each other, that they've, they've become familiar with each other, they pull even more. They pull 32,000 pounds. But if you get two that have known each other since childhood, two that have known each other since childhood, they pull 52,000 pounds of dead weight. Long-term relationships have power. Long-term relationships have power, people. Amen. Go ahead. Whatever, whatever got you out of church, let's go to church. Let's go back and learn how to pull heavy weights together that are way beyond anything we could do in our own capacity. One of the greatest tragedies is to see beautiful relationships broken. Old friends come apart. But God has healing. Because the healing of the relationship often leads to the healing of their body. Just as much as the sickness in the relationship led to a paralysis in the body. This man didn't need healing so much as forgiveness. Jesus says, what's the difference? If I say be, be healed or your sins are forgiven. And in this case, he chose to say, your sins are forgiven, stand up and walk. He didn't say, your body is healed, stand up and walk. He said, join the dots, people. The man has the need of forgiveness in his life, and that's going to that's gonna set him free. So getting set free from, from unforgiveness at whatever level in our life, and forgiveness is a big issue. Never underestimate the power of forgiveness or unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a big hole in your spiritual wall that the devil can get access to you and start to manipulate you. Torment lives in people's minds because they have not forgiven. And you may be obsessing and fixating on certain thoughts in your life about a divorce, about a child that's wounded you, about a friend or whatever, and it, it's like having torment in your mind. That person is ruling your life. You're being manipulated from within because you haven't let them go. When I, uh, Chris and I were 23, we started a church in Littleton in Christchurch. And the reason it's called Littleton is because it's a little town. 3,000 people. God sent us there. Uh, I think it was a small town because he just, and he, and he didn't, the church, you know, I mean, we started with 15 people. After three years, we had 30. Explosion. Uh, I don't think God let the church go because he wanted to minimize the damage. Uh, he, he loved those people, just wanted to care for them so that our, our mistakes wouldn't be to spread too broad. You know, like, but in that time, uh, we led a little English woman to the Lord. Her name was Prim. She was from Sumner, and just around the corner. And so uh, I said, Prim, what about your husband? And she said, oh, he, doesn't, he has got no interest in the church at all. And so I said, I'll come around and see him. So I went around and see him. Now, John <clears throat> had emphysema. He was 60, 66, and he smoked, just smoked all the time. And so when you, you spoke to John, it was a laborious, quite, a, quite an effort. He was... And, and you tended, when he told you things, you'd get the weather, not the news. You, you know, just sort of spittle and... It was, it was an interesting deal. So I go, John, how are you? you know, I'm not coming along to your blingity blink church. If that's what you hear, I'm not interested in God. Get out of here. You know, what, what, what have I got to do with all that? And that, that was his attitude. So I just kept going back. Took a raincoat, you know, umbrella. And we, we'd talk and talk and talk. He's always, <laughs> it was just, it was, it was difficult. 
So, so I, I've got like, John, you know, after a while, I just said, John, just let me pray for you. Just say the prayer. And you look, oh, then you may do what you like, you know. I said, well, you just need to say some words after me. It'll be a long prayer, but, we, we, you know, we'll get there. It's only five words, but we'll get there eventually. I said, you know, and so we said the prayer. And next morning, I rang him up. I rang him up. I said, John, how are you doing? He said, well, 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 I, I need to let you know that uh, I actually do feel a bit better. I said, John, you're not wheezing. You know, we, you, I mean, you, yeah, you're not, you haven't got that raspy throat. He said, I know. I said, that's a miracle, John. He said, uh, well, that's not actually the real miracle. Now, the reason he was so angry is because he had retired. And when he retired, he wanted to just go sailing on his boat and go fishing. And so he brought in a, 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 a partner into his printing business to manage it and, and to keep it going so he could still get his superannuation, get an income. And so this guy he brought in, though, he didn't check him out, and he was a bankrupt. And so all the creditors swooped in and took all the printing presses, took all the superannuation, took, the man, took John's house, took his boat, took everything. So he was left penniless when he's meant to be retiring after a, year, a lifetime of working. And he said to me, if I ever see that man, uh, if you've got a God, the only thing I want your God to do is make him walk in front of me while I'm driving. I'm going to run him down. That's my prayer. He said, I don't, don't tell my wife, but I got a gun in my front room. And if I see him walking outside, I'm going to shoot him. And so I, this was his story, you know, when, that he had told me. And I said, John, it's, it's amazing listening to you. He said, that's not the greatest miracle. He said, the great miracle is that every night when I went to bed, I would, before I went to sleep, I'd open my heart, I'd pull out this cage, and I'd take a knife, and I had that guy in the cage, and I'd just stab him. I just hated him. He'd ruined my life. He'd stolen everything I had. And then I'd put the cage back in my heart, and I'd feel okay. I'd go to sleep. But he said, last night, when I went to bed, and I was about to go through this little ritual, I opened my heart, took out the cage, and I looked at that man, and I opened the door of the cage, and I said, I forgive you. I let it go. <laughs> you know, uh, when you forgive somebody, you set them free. When you receive forgiveness, you get set free. This, this man that these people, these four guys had carried as a team, let, come, let's go to the house of the Lord. They came in there, but here's the thing. It said the power of God was present to heal the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the legalists who are all there. It says, all these teachers of the law had come from everywhere. And they were sitting there. And the power of God was present to heal them. But none of them got healed. Because they weren't ready to receive forgiveness or to give forgiveness. Forgiveness is extremely powerful in the healing process. And here today, I would love for you, number one, to forgive everybody everything they've ever done to you in your entire life. It can be very difficult because you can feel like I'm the victim. It's unjust. That they need to be punished. So be it. Whatever. But you are not that, you're not the punisher. I know we would prefer that the scripture says vengeance is fine, but it actually says vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So, so let him go. And you will find that instantly healing will come into your own life. Not forgiving somebody is like drinking poison and hoping the other person is going to die. You are infecting that area of your life that needs wholeness. 
The second thing is receive forgiveness. Sometimes the biggest block to forgiveness, sometimes the biggest block to, to your forgiveness down there in Invercargill or Queenstown and in Westgate, Botany or Balclutha, is that we, we can't receive it. We don't feel worthy. We think we should be punished. We think we need to pay more. But you cannot. We dishonor the sacrifice of Jesus if we think we can add anything to it. You can't do one thing. The only reason Jesus died for any of us is to set us free so that we can freely accept forgiveness. And now I know people. I know a particular man pretty close to me who was in an adulterous affair, had a child to that adulterous affair, but could never forgive himself thinking that somehow that kept God happy. But you couldn't be further wrong because the only reason Jesus died was to set you free from your own stumblings and mistakes. And every single one of us here have actually had one of those stumbles. There's not one of us in the room who's got it all together. We've all made mistakes and we all need the blood of Jesus, the grace of God, and forgiveness. So stop roasting yourself over something that has been forgiven. When you go to God, you say, oh, God, I'm so sorry again. Here I am. Oh, God, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, I feel terrible. He goes like, uh, tell me, wh- wh- what are you talking about? Well, you know what I did last year. I'm like, ah, it's so bad. He says, what day was that? It was, oh, it was a Wednesday night. Oh, it's 7 o'clock. Oh, I screamed. I'm like, oh, my kids. Oh. He says, uh, was, that, was that 2018? Wednesday, 7th of February. This is blank up here. We've got no record. There's, there's nothing here. We got, it's been rubbed out. You confessed it once. You confessed it once. Forget the former things. Forget the former things. Behold, I do a new thing. If you're constantly obsessing over the things of the past, you'll never be able to grab a hold of the things of your future. If you're, if you're looking in your rear vision mirror, you're going to crash into your future. The reason we have a very large windscreen is so that the vision is bigger than our, than our rear vision. You can't, be, you can't be looking backwards and moving forwards. It's done. Refuse the thought. Forget the former things. I have found that most people who think they've got a bad memory have actually got a bad forgettery. They remember the things they should forget and forget the things they should remember. Forget it. When it comes creeping up, he says, remember me, remember He said, no, I'm not, not looking, not looking, not looking. And it hangs around there because the devil wants to accuse you and remind you of your sins. And you're going, no, I'm not looking there, I'm not looking there, I'm not looking there. And you go, I'm just take a little peek. And it's got you. And you're walking around with this alien on your head all day long. Cast it out this morning. Condemnation. You bully in the brain, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And I cast out the accuser and command freedom in the name of Jesus. Let every single person in this room experience the healing power of God's forgiveness. And I'm telling you this morning, your sins are forgiven. You're healed. You're set free in the name of Jesus. I have the power to do that. As a representative of Jesus Christ, as an ambassador of heaven, I have the power to remit sins. In the name of Jesus, and I'm telling you here today in the power of Jesus' name that His blood is sufficient to wipe away your sins and to set you free. In the name of Jesus, there is not one sin that He cannot wipe out of your life. You are forgiven, you're standing up, you're unstuck, and you've got momentum in Jesus' name.